This can be a difficult set of readings to listen to or preach about on a Sunday morning. So let's dive right into it. Because what Jesus is talking about is something that is fundamental to our faith. It's about the conversion cycle. It's about the path to the kingdom of God. And it can be a little bit challenging. But notice that there are in general three parts. There's some kind of rule following part and there's some kind of internal relationship with God part, and then there's some kind of external how we deal with our neighbors part. So let's talk about each of those. Because that, and let's talk about them in that order because that's the order Jesus gives them. So, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Oh, and by the way, if anyone thinks Jesus is utterly humorless, notice the one-liner. Why do you call me good? No one but God is good. Okay, we all get the joke. But then he starts out with this list of doctrines, with this list of rules, you know, the commandments, don't kill, adultery, steal, false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, okay, those things that we know. And it seems like that is the first step to entering into the kingdom of God. And it could well be, I think it is for most of us, I'm going to call it a step because one of the points I'm going to make is that this cycle is exactly that. You can enter it at any point and all parts reinforce all the other parts. But good enough. We know the doctrines. We follow the commandments. But then there's a second part. This difficult kind of internal relationship with God part. I've observed these from my youth and Jesus looking at him loved him. You know, it's just one little line right there in the middle of this long reading, but it's an extremely important one. The young man loved Jesus, good teacher he calls him, and Jesus looking at him loves him. That's the second part of this cycle of conversion I'm talking about, love. And it's an interior love in most of our lives between God and us. But then there's a third one. And, and I'm not really sure what to call this. I mean, in, in moral theology, it's called the fundamental option. Um, I kind of call it the gut check. Uh, you can call it by many things. But after steps one and two, there is a kind of so what moment. So what, what do I do with my life? How does this really affect me? And it's different for each of us. For the wealthy young man here who has many possessions, and that was a little bit rare back then in Jesus's time, it's deny that part of your life, at least for now. Go and sell what you got, that's fine. It's getting in the way of doing what's most important in your life. It could be different for each of us. That thing that gets in the way of this third part, which is the fundamental option to live our lives for, for Jesus, for Christ, for God. In the Jesuit world, and I, work over at Loyal Academy, I'm a Jesuit. In the Jesuit world, we call it being a man or woman for others. It was memorably phrased that way back in 1973 by the Father General of the Order, a guy named Father Pedro Arupe, and he gave a memorable speech, many people walked out on him as he was giving it, about how Jesuit education was failing. It was failing those that it was supposed to teach to be hombres para los dentros. He was said it in Spanish. That roughly translates into men for the rest. Otros would be others. Los dentros is the rest. We've, we've kind of translated this into women and men for others. But there is that, that kind of, that 
connotation of the rest that sneaks into women and men for others. And you see this cycle, or I see it a lot, at Loyal Academy, you know, freshman year, you gotta learn to follow the rules. You don't wanna get too many demerits, or as we call them, jugs. It's a shortenization, that's a real word, a shortenization of uh, Latin, jugum, yoke, jug. All right, so you don't wanna get too many demerits. By the end of your sophomore year, you pretty much got it. And you've also had two years of spirituality and prayer and retreats. And sometime during your third year, your junior year, most, you know, somewhere in the 70% of our juniors go on something called a Kairos retreat. Kairos, not Latin, but Greek this time, means God's time. And it's a fundamental change in these young people's spiritual lives because they come to realize that just as their relationship with their parents is changing as they're growing up, so must their relationship with God. And that if they keep viewing God as Santa Claus or something like that, it's not going to work. And they come back as changed people. And then there's that third part of this cycle, this desire, this need to have God's newly understood love for us, newly understood by us, reflected in how we deal with other people. And that's when the true women and men for others part really starts to take hold. With upperclassmen, junior year, especially senior year, you see it really start to, to engage. And that's the beauty of it because then you realize two things. And usually, I start out with the, the Old Testament, work my way into the New Testament, but this time I'm gonna start out with the New Testament reading and I'm, gonna, I'm working my way back to the Old Testament. You realize two things, all right? First off, you realize that this is a cycle. It's not a ladder that you climb up where you start with doctrine and go with some kind of personal relationship with God and then move on up into service to others. It's a cycle. Every part affects every other part. The doctrine supports the love and the labor. The labor actually is done best when it's supported by the doctrine and the commandments. The love of God helps us do both. It's, it's all intertwined, wheels spinning within wheels. So I realized that. But we realize something else as well, and this is kind of the tricky and the beautiful part of this. So in our first two readings, we heard about the psalmist, or, or excuse me, the, uh, the wisdom writer praying for the holy wisdom to enter into his life, and it did, and it was wonderful. It was better than gold and silver. And then in the letter to the Hebrews, we hear about the effects of that. And the author saying, you know, I invited the word of God into my life and all of a sudden it cut me to the bone. And I had to realize what my life meant both to God and to others. And so that's the second point. Not only is this a cycle, but it sneaks in and affects all part of our lives. When we invite God in to help us with a personal relationship or with how we deal with others around us, it sneaks in and affects all our lives, all parts of our life. It's called the kingdom of God, and it's a beautiful thing. And it only works with God. How is this possible, you might ask? How can one person's life be changed in a fundamental way and because of this affect all parts of their life and affect the lives of everyone around them? That's called the kingdom of God. How is that possible? It's possible because of God. It's not something that we pull ourselves up to by our own bootstraps at all. We have to, yes, 
be accepting of the gift, but in the end, it is a gift from God, and all things are possible with God. Thank you for joining us today. Our digital ministry provides a valuable service to parishioners and visitors alike. How wonderful that we can share God's Word, the celebration of the Eucharist, and other important words and events with those who may not be able to be with us in person. If you would like to support this effort, please go to olphglenview.org, click on the gold donate button, and then the Sunday giving icon to make a contribution on our secure online giving portal. We sincerely appreciate your past and ongoing support. Thank you for helping us continue this ministry. God bless. Thank you.